So a brief recap, and I don't want to turn this freaking lights on. So hopefully you guys see okay. So where does leptin come from? I'm not going to answer this. Primarily, who said that? Say it louder. From your fat cell. And each fat cell produces it. Each fat cell. So the person who has more fat cells and the person who has larger fat cells is going to have a lot more. So when they used to say, oh, I have a really slow fat metabolism. Do people still say that today? Like, I can't lose weight because I have a slow fat metabolism. Your parent, your mom might say that or your dad. It's the reverse. You have a super high fat metabolism. The problem is it's not matching your expenditure, right? And so even if you're not consuming a whole lot of food, that food consumption is getting a much larger fuel response. So calories in, calories out isn't necessarily accurate from the food intake level. It's more accurate from how the food stimulates your fat cells level. How much fuel are you getting from your fat is really the caloric, what we should be counting and we can't. We can't do that, right? Because we don't know how large your fat cells, the general amount of your visceral fat is. We don't know what the large cells. We don't know how much you have. We can just assume based on visceral fat that that's why much larger fat cells, visceral meaning in the, ab the abdomen area. Um, and that those cells produce a whole lot more fuel, but they don't burn that much fuel. They don't utilize it. Right. So they, a lot, they're, they're very effective, but you're not necessarily utilizing all that food, all that fuel. So in short, um, who, so who's, let me, let me, let me start with this. So hunger. If leptin levels in the brain are low, what happens? If leptin levels in the brain go down, what happens? Hmm. Hunger goes up. Yeah. So why why is that why would that be beneficial if leptin levels in the brain go down what what does that tell us about leptin levels in the body i'm giving you guys a little pop quiz right now anybody remember okay i'm going to start we're going to go back upstream okay so here's a fat cell. Here's where the fat gets burned and created into fuel, right? This is the mitochondria. The lipids, fatty acids, have to get inside there to break down through beta oxidation to then be available to go through the Krebs cycle. We don't need to know that part, but it has to be broken down. It gets broken down in here, and then it you it, it and then it gets chopped up and metabolized into ATP, which is human fuel, right? Human gasoline. What leptin does when it's elevated is these doors open up that where they can get in. I want to call them a door. Those of you who are in cell biology, CPT1, CPT2. CPT1 is on the outside, CPT2 is on the inside. It goes through this transformational process, can get in there, beta oxidation. Let's do OA. Chuck, chuck, chuck. Right? So leptin goes up, fat metabolism goes up. Okay? If leptin goes down, these doors start to shut. So fat can't get in at the same high rate. So the rate that the leptin can get into the mitochondria goes down. So if leptin starts to get higher, more of the, the, the fatty acids can get in. Leptin goes down, the fat can't get in at the same rate. It might be too low. So what happens is if leptin goes down, fat metabolism declines. And that means you don't have as much 
ATP, which is gasoline, where the fuel need might still be elevated. So your activity level, let's say you're on a walk, you're just you're util utilizing mostly body fat for fuel, but if your fuel demands, let's just use the number 10 if, or 100, you need 100. When leptin levels are adequate, you're getting 100. Right. And again, this is really linear, but in general, you want to keep it at balance, right? Your fuel demands what you need that it's capable of providing, right? At some point, if you're, let's say your fat only provides 60, that means that you have 40, let's say, needs for energy that are not, that's not getting met. Are you guys following me right now? So there's a point at which when leptin goes down, this this goes down, which means there's got to be something to make up the difference, right? And at rest, chances are it's blood glucose at rest, right? And so what is blood glucose regulated for? Your brain. The amount you have in your blood is not regulated for your skeletal muscular system. It is not. It is regulated to be in this zone to adequately feed your brain. So if your skeletal muscular system starts utilizing that glucose, which is a cool thing, going through glycolysis to produce ATP, your blood sugar is going to drop. That tells the brain you need something to stimulate your fat to do its job because this isn't doing its job at the moment. And it's starting to compete with the brain's fuel, right? And the brain gets a little ticked off. So as blood sugar goes down, brain leptin goes down, you get the activation of the um, enzymes that control hunger, right? So this hunger is biologically vital because if we don't have a internal way to stimulate leptin in the moment, we can, we can stimulate it hormonally by food consumption. Food consumption stimulates your fat to release more leptin. Okay, so hunger is a way for your brain to say, go get something that will, one, restore this for me sooner than later, right? But more so than this, because this doesn't take a whole lot to regulate, it's going to get this to start doing its job again so that there's less demand coming from blood sugar. Any questions about that? Any of you, like, really the main thing you, that will be helpful for you is just recognizing if you're hungry, your fat is not supplying adequate fuel. Body fat is ideal. It is the ideal fuel for your body. And it's meant to be fueling most of what you do every day, 90%, right? Unless you start exercising and then we have glycogen and we have all these other cool mechanisms that can be used and then they can re be restored. But ideally body fat is what you're using almost all day long. That's just how everybody works, right? Um, so if it's inefficient or if it's not really doing its job, again, the major issue is that it will your body will tap into blood sugar. The brain knows it as soon as blood sugar goes down, leptin goes down, and then your hunger goes up. So you actually biologically need food for hormonal reasons. So you might not need food when you're hungry for nutritional reasons at the moment. You might be totally fine with your nutrition, but hormonally you might not be, right? So especially if you're on like a multivitamin, chances are you're all getting adequate nutrition. Um, the problem is that you're maybe not paying attention to those biological rhythms and you're eating at a time where your hormones are elevated. So the issue with eating without hunger um, is that 
If, if you're not hungry, so let's reverse this. So blood sugar is fine. Brain leptin is fine, right? These enzymes are turned off. Hunger is turned off, right? Blood sugar is remaining stable. One, because you're at rest. We're not talking about exercise. That means that leptin levels are adequately getting fueled, fueling your body through fat metabolism. And there's really the flux around, if you need 100, the flux between what you're getting from fat and blood sugar is mostly coming from fat, right? You're not hungry. You're getting fuel from your fat adequately, right? So if you eat anyways, what happens to your leptin levels? So let's say So let's say here is how much your body needs, right? So on the hunger scale, we can even use this for the hunger scale, right? Here is the quantity of leptin. And your needs. So let's see your biological core fueling needs is right in here. Right. This is about the range ish for whatever activity that you're doing that is sustainable, right? You're not sprinting again. Okay. So if you're here already, you should not be hungry. Hunger should not be there at all biologically. Does not mean you're not bored and have desire. Doesn't mean that someone else is eating in front of you and you're like, poor me, I'm a victim. Everybody else is eating and I'm not hungry, right? So if you're not hungry, you're here. You're in the Goldilocks zone. You're in the, the sweet spot, okay? So what happens if you eat anyways to your blood leptin level? They go up. Yep. So this is what happens. Here's the blood leptin. It's exponential, right? You get more. You get more. So fuel-wise, you are now in this zone. And so you're going to have excess fuel, right? The food that you just ate, is it in a biological form to be utilized? So the food that I ate this morning, is it biologically available to be used for, in the mitochondria right now? What's your answer? You're going like this. No, right? Why? Why do you think? If uh, the answer is no, why is it not available right now? Well, it's digesting. Yeah. Like it's not unless I have straight sugar, right? It's digesting. The food you eat is not biologically available. It has to go through a lengthy digestive process, especially since I was eating high fiber, high fat, you know, high protein. There was all, in fact, high carbohydrate. Everything was pretty saturated together. It's got to be, you know, a stir. It's got to be decomposed, right? And where, where does it store? What I ate, where is it stored? Who knows? Where, who knows where all the food I ate this morning went? I mean, where is it in digestion? That's the first question. And then do we even know where it's going to go? Is it structural? Is it going to be in the membranes? Is it going to be used to, is it going to be used in skeletal muscle? Am I using, is it helping rebuild my liver and my kidneys? Is it helping, what is it doing? Do we really know what the food I ate this morning is doing and where it's going to go in the biological function of my body? We have no freaking clue, right? <laughs> we don't know. The fat I ate could, is really important. It's going to be used to, you know, uh, in all of the membranes. There is so much fat involved in this membrane. There is, it, it's everywhere, right? It's used all over the place. So the idea that the food you eat today, and the fueling in that food today, is 100% needs to be metabolized 
by your muscles through activity is actually very not true, right? Calories in, calories out is an old concept that needs to be thrown out the door because the calories in, calories out is actually relative to what your fat is stimulating to the body, right? Any questions about that? Anybody confused? So if you're not hungry in your eating, you're telling your body to release fuel, even though it's actually in a, in a balanced fueling position, you're producing more fuel and you may or may not be utilizing it. Right. If you go, let's say, let's say you go exercise right after that. That's confusing because your gut is trying to digest. So you're switching back into fight flight gears versus rest and digest gears. So ideally, you wait until you're hungry, right? Because on this end of it, leptin is lower, it's no longer inside your needs in this moment, right? And this is where the body will tap into blood sugar. And this is where your brain starts to say, hell no, I'm hungry, right? Is that helping you guys kind of piece this together? You're confused, you got it? So when you're not hungry, it's balanced. That's a great thing. So if you're not hungry, you know, your hormones are doing, you're living off of your back primarily. So, if you come into this zone, again, there's so much grays. It's not black and white. This is mostly gray here and gray here, right? The idea of calories in, calories out is black and white. No, yes, and that's not true. Of the amount of fuel your body needs, like of 100% of your fuel needs, I think I got this right. I could be wrong. I'm going to look it up. 25% of your daily fuel needs go to your brain. And the more active you are with your brain, the more fuel it needs. So every single person in here has really hot, probably much higher levels of brain fueling demands. I think the other 20 percent, there's like a 20 percent goes to your liver. Can someone Google that right now? I'm pretty sure. And then I think your kidneys need 5 percent. Did I be wrong? Someone correct me. And then the rest is skeletal muscle. And obviously this number can get bigger. This can get bigger, right? Depending on your activity, how much muscle you have, the degree of, you know, ex the intensity level of your exercise can change that demand, right? Because my skeletal muscle needs walking my dogs for an hour is very different than if I get on the step mill or the gauntlet for an hour, right? Where I'm going up a hill. But anybody find that out? Metabolic breakdown? What, how much, anybody? I'm pretty sure this is about right. Brain, liver, kidney. And then there's also, um, you know, the degree of metabolizing that goes into to digestion. So I think that's another percentage of uh, just how much fuel it takes to digest your food throughout the day, right? So again, the food you eat isn't necessarily, you know, we don't really know where it's going. So the concept of calories in and out is really inferior when it, when you really apply it to just how dynamic the body is and how incredible it is at, at the flux and change between fueling mechanisms depending on what you're doing, right? So I think it would be good for us to go into more detail on the hunger scale. Anybody have any questions before I raise this? This, this conversation around leptin isn't necessarily um, 
taught intensely in kinesiology only because when you're in exercise or activity or in competition, it is really, for the most part, regulated not by fat, but by your glycogen stores, your blood sugar. Um, if you're utilizing more fat, of course, endurance athletes use a lot more fat, but if you're a competitive endurance athlete, you are using a ton of glycogen and people do tons of things and different ways to eat, to build your glycogen storage so that you have a bigger pool of glycogen in your muscles. And then, yeah. And then at that point, you're eating carbs while you're competing. You know, we're talking about like two to three hour endurance athletes that are competing for time. They're trying to get into glycogen because they're at such a high rate of need. If they're, if you as an endurance athlete, you know, I'm totally digressing, but if you're an endurance athlete, you're not going to be competing at 60% your VO2 max. Anybody understand what I'm talking about right now? You're, you're going to be at like 70, 80% if you're, if you're an athlete. So in general, leptin isn't necessarily talked about when it comes to competition. When it's important, it more so is when you're working with someone who might have a much larger amount of fat, right? Because th then they might have higher protein needs, let's say because they're weight training. Like if you're weight training a ton, your protein needs are probably going to go up, at least in the beginning. You're going to need more protein when you're in growth periods, and then it goes down. You actually don't need as much protein unless you're in a growth period. Um, so your food intake might need to go up and the timing of your food intake might need to change. But if you're struggling with visceral body fat, larger white cell fat timing, wh what do you prioritize? You know, getting enough amino acids or your leptin levels, right? Your inflammatory levels. My approach in a medical weight loss field was prioritize leptin, get yourself out of inflammation, the amino acids and the weight training can come with it. Anyways, that's just my approach. There's more than that. There's lots of options. There's more than one way to do things correctly. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, the hunger scale. We're gonna go over that quickly. And then I wanna start talking about um, Satter's hierarchy of needs and how this applies to our biological wiring psychologically um, and how we relate to food consumption that is so beyond what I just described. Because if you have food available when you're hungry, you're doing real good, right? Everything's pretty good for you. Um, and, and when you compare it to, let's say, thousands of years of living in feast and famine and famine and feast and more famine and, you know, hardship, right? We have such easy access to food and a huge variety of food as well. Um, so we have lots of cultural um, options. How many of you like Indian food? I love Indian food. Montalban, who's your favorite? I love Montalban. You guys go, where do you guys go here? Anybody have a favorite Indian food? You do? No? Okay. How about sushi? I love sushi. Right. So a hundred years ago, would we have invoicing? Would we have those options available to us? Right. That's food probably because there was a Basque influence from Spain. Um, but no, but now we have everything and that's just two different types, Italian food, Spanish food, Mexican food. Ooh, so good. Right. So we have so much available to us, so much variety. Um, and we have easy access. Gas stations have food in them, right? The options in this building, foods in this building, um, it's, the grocery stores. I mean, we have so much access. Um, the question is, why would we overconsume, right? Why would there be so much overconsumption if we're not living in famine, right? What is it that might create overconsumption? 
So really quick, we're gonna go over the hunger scale. Um, one to five, fullness scale, six to 10. That would be the whole scale. I'd like to look at it like an upside down U curve. Five is here on the top, really. Five to six. Four, three, two, one. So four is I'm hungry but could wait. That's patient. Three is I got to eat now, right? That's the big difference between those two. Two is your blood sugar has been tapped into further than it needs to be. Your body is starting to lower your thyroid. Starts to decline. Reduction in energy. You might start feeling a little cold, right? You might actually start feeling better in the zone. Right, but really here is where the brain starts to get a little angry. So ideally you don't get to a three because you want to have patience to have good tasting food. So as you eat, hunger does go away, but that doesn't mean that you're satisfied, right? So ideally you push beyond this so that you get to a place where you know, I feel good. I could eat more, right? I don't have any distension. I don't have any physical discomfort, but I I could stop too. So the, this is harder to do. It's much easier to understand hunger, given the time to get hungry, than it is to really understand the backside of fullness. So this is a danger. This is pain, right? This is like you're gonna explode. And you may have to go to the hospital. This is typical Thanksgiving. People have to unbutton their pants. They are really uncomfortable. You're gonna pass out. Like this is also painful. Unbutton pants, change clothes. This is when you start wearing things that don't have buttons, right? Flexible. When people say I'm full, this is what they're saying. That means I am full, my gut is full. They're feeling maybe a little acid reflux. So heartburn can happen in between these two numbers. This is a mechanical feeling. The mechanical feeling of the gut is eight, right? Seven is satiated. Um, I do not need to eat anymore. There might be some room, I'm not in pain, but I don't need to eat more. And then satisfied or content. But I, I could totally have a few more bites. A few more bites. And here is, yeah, I'm satisfied. And if I eat more, I'm going to be full. Right? So ideally, you're somewhere in here. So sometimes I'll have people start stop at a six. There's lag time. We talked about that on Monday. So... You might stop at a six and then 20 minutes later, you might go, oh God, okay. Or you might think you stopped at a six, but you really were at a seven. And then 20 minutes later, you're like, oh shit, I am full. So that lag time you have to pay attention to. It can be the faster you eat, the more. So if I'm super hungry and I get to a two and I start eating super fast, so I'm not chewing the food very much, I'm just trying to make the pain go away. Remember, this is kind of painful on this side too. It's more of an agitation than this type of pain, right? The brain is telling you, eat now, eat fast. Eat now, eat fast. That's how it works, that's the sensation. You're going to eat really fast and you're going to be, you're going to hit here without even knowing it because you're eating so fast that your body's fueling mechanisms, your leptin, your blood sugar haven't caught up yet. Right? So slow down. If you, if you, again, if you can prevent getting too hungry, you're probably going to have more patience. You're going to want to taste the food. You're going to want to like understand it from, from the palate, from that kind of pleasure center of the brain crunchy, smooth, salt, sweet. And you're going to be chewing a little bit more. You're going to be tasting it a little bit more and you're going to get a very much more clear signal of satiation or being satisfied. So again, ideally you're going from three and a half. That's your, that would be a great goal. So as you guys practice this, you might not be, you might be like, oh my God, I don't know. That's fine. Let yourself get to a two. 
So I need you guys to listen because I'm giving you instruction. If you really don't know where you're at on the hunger scale, get hungrier. Get freaking hungry. So you can tell the difference. Don't be afraid of it. Be like, what does it feel when Robin says, there's a sense of eat now. It feels impulsive. Eat too much. Feel that. Do it. Let yourself understand those edges. If you don't know what fullness feels like, eat till you're full. Do it as an experiment. You're trying to learn. Your body can handle this. You can handle both edges. Try to understand it. Be the observer. Don't criticize those edges. So if you're not quite sure, my instruction is get too hungry, get too full, and then work in from there. Does that make sense? Okay. So let's go into Maslow Tire Kidneys. I know how much you guys love this. So here we are. We're just going to do the bottom three, right? Belonging. This is kind of important. In fact, this can hijack this um, environment safety. And then this would be food, water, sleep excretion. So just so you know, oftentimes when you look at people who reference Maslow, they're using his original 1954 version. Do you remember that one? Just five. It's the one I have on our, on our, um, um, canvas. And so this would be esteem and then self-actualization. And then that's all they have. Remember he, he really studied spirituality more later. And then the other thing that has really been argued, if you look at modern like research on this theory, is they've taken, and I'm totally digressing, sex, and they put it here. So sex used to be a biological need. You don't need sex to survive. So they've moved it to belonging. It's still very important, right? So I think in when Dr. Satter, or um, the, she's a dietitian, when she wrote the PDF you're going to read, it says sex is at the bottom. That's because it was, I think, published in 1999. It's down there. So just so you know. So what is it? What would happen? And I need you to really go into this instinctively because we all have this built in. It's hardwired into our core. What would it be like if your access to food was shut off? That includes water, but let's just focus on food. Like, no money, no way to get it. How would your, what would you be prioritizing today? This kind of goes back to our practice of cataclysm. What would you do first? You know, access to food goes down. You're going to start thinking about maybe fishing in the Boise River. You're going to be like, what do I have access to? What do I have? What if you have food in your backpack? Would you start um, Would you start binging on that food, eating it all at once? How many of you feel that you would eat it all at once? How many of you feel that you would want to spread it out? Okay, that's instinct. And that's actually the way it works. Instinctively, if this is threatened, you are going, it's precious, it becomes very precious, right? Um, so what, I'm going to go into a little different view than Satter. Satter is a dietitian, and again, you're going to read your stuff before Monday, write a quick paragraph on it. She definitely hones in on the need for pleasure, so, um, which is very important. In the late 1800s, early 1900s, do you guys remember, you guys, have you heard of Pavlov and his dogs yet? <laughs> right, ring the bell and the dog's mouth with water. So the anticipation of pleasure starts digestion. Why else would the dog's mouth salivate with the bell ringing? Does anybody need me to, who doesn't know about um, um, Pavlov's dogs? I'm gonna I'm gonna say it just in case someone hasn't learned this yet. 
scientists looking at digestion, wanting to understand conditioning, uh, um, meaning can you do something repeated and does the body anticipate it from happening? And they were really looking at digestion under different circumstances. And the scientists had dogs and cats that they had that they were looking at in their research. And they started to, he would ring a bell right when they would feed the dogs. Ring the bell, feed the dogs. Ring the bell, feed the dogs. They wanted to know if they ring the bell, right? If the dog's body would anticipate it, not just behaviorally, like do they know it's going to happen, but they would look at their gut. Their, they had ports and they noticed the dogs, they would actually salivate. So biologically, the body was priming before food was even there, was anticipating digestion. Then they started to play with different types of foods for both cats and dogs. And they also started looking at human beings. Um, they uh, noticed that in particular with human beings, because our, our mouths are different and the pleasure center is a little more sensitive um, because we don't, for a lot of different reasons. Um, they, they noticed that when they were feeding people food that tasted like crap, that they did not digest the food well, they did not salivate, that there wasn't as much absorption. They, so they, they would test, they would collect urine, they would collect their waste, they would test the ports, where's the food at? And then they would, um, in testing so, so, um, saliva, um, gastric, um, juices or digestive ju juices that are secreted, the more pleasurable the food, the more salivation, the more digestion, the more peristalsis, which is the, the um, actual contracting of the muscles and the, um, the in intestines would occur. And so the, the, they, then they would take people who at the time might've, um, they sought out people who had didn't have access to the stomach. So someone might have drank something corrosive and it corroded their esophagus and they had to be fed by a port. So they didn't have from the mouth to the stomach connection. And they were testing like what to eat and what would happen in the gut. And that you could put food um, in the gut, like just put food in the port and nothing would happen. Food was in the stomach and no digestion would occur, none. No, there was like no signal that there was food there, even though it was there. So they would then have to have the person chew food to tell the brain there is food in digestion, right? So you have to have pleasure. There has to be a signal from the mouth to the brain that you are consuming food to get proper digestion. If you are eating foods that you don't necessarily like, it doesn't digest as effectively as food that you like. The other thing, if you are, so then this sounds cool, okay? Because at the time it was like 1890s and 1910, you know, they would strap down a cat and they would have a dog bark at it. And then they would test how long would it take for this cat to want food for it to start to have any like signs of digestion? Like they would give it food and then it wouldn't digest at all. Up to six hours after being stimulated in a fight or flight way. This has been repeated over, over, over again. They specifically wrote about clients, humans then that would come in and they would study who had all these digestive processes problems. And they would notice that the people who had more difficulty, let's say one woman in particular that they wrote about, had all sorts of digestive problems. And they found out one time, every time they'd come in, you know, they would check her digestion, check, you know, uh, how the food was going in the gut, her waste, right? And nothing was really digesting very well at all. Then she came in for a follow-up and it was like her digestion was so much better. 
they were like, whoa, 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 what happened? Well, she um, left her husband. Her husband was beating her. He had alcoholism. Clearly, I have compassion for this situation on both sides. There's problems involved here. But she was in chronic fight or flight. And they used that like, okay, we're seeing what we saw in the cats and in the dogs and in these other animals and humans. It's just, we can't make them be traumatized. <laughs> we can't make them stay in a, you know. So that was a big um, part of the research too, is observing the differences between people who are in calm, like looking at the central nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system how rest and digestion works and how when you're in fight or flight, you are not crying to digest food. Your body is actually wanting to use the energy, the a very high amount of energy used to digest. It needs to go to the limbs. It needs to go to your muscles. It needs to go towards sprinting, glycolysis, using a glycogen. It doesn't necessarily want to just be chill, right? So the state of mind going into, for example, tracking your hunger rhythms, if you are in high anxiety, if you are highly stressed, this is going to be hard because you're probably not going to know if you're hungry or not, which is understandable. There's nothing wrong with that. So let's just say while you're tracking in the next five days or five of the next seven days, however you do it. You get in a fight with your significant other or you get into a, a car accident, write that down. Just observe it. Just witness it like you're one of the scientists. How long does it take for you to actually feel like you can stomach food? Um, it's going to be very different. Let's just say you get in a car accident. That's going to be very like um, exciting, right? Very different than someone who is highly emotional because they feel sorry for themselves. So what I noticed over 10 years of working with people in a clinical setting is that someone who is in a pity party, who is in a victim state, who is feeling sorry for themselves will eat and they will eat a ton of food. Whereas someone who actually has real hardship, okay, what I'm talking about is like not promoted, distorted hardship. We're talking like, my mom was diagnosed with cancer. They can't eat. They just, they can't. I've had people diagnosed with binge eating disorder. They will binge when they feel sorry for themselves. They won't binge. In fact, they can't eat when they actually have a, a real emergency, which is really interesting, right? So be aware of where you're at in terms of your stress, okay? and how that might impact food impulsivity. So that's where we get into Saturn hierarchy of needs. So I'm gonna give you my version first. The first thing, and I and let's put you in the frame of mind to actually understand this more easily. Cataclysm, right? Something, your access to food is gone, right? The first thing your brain, right? Again, think of it like your survival brain in terms of these evolutionary psychological awareness needs is, is there access? Do I even have access to food? Do I have food, right? It's just, it doesn't matter much. Just do I have some? Then we go to quantity. Is it enough? So I'm breaking it down a little bit more. Uh, sadder, what you're going to read is more, more like access is one. I'm breaking down access to real understanding around it. Do I have it? Is it enough? Third? You may want to make a guess. Not yet. We're getting there. What would be next for poor quality? Do I have some right now? Do Is it enough? What else would we be thinking about? This is right there, you guys. All of you have this hardwired in there, I just think. Um, yes. Or can I get more? 
It's the actual recycling of. So how many of you have food storage? I do. Can I get more? That's what that is. That's a survival mechanism. It's it's can I? Yeah. Do I have the ability to get more? This is where you would want to have like hunting gear and foraging knowledge, seeds, preservation, right? Can I get more? So. Is it safety? So it's not about quality. It's really about safety. Quality is like a rich person's thing. Safe to eat. Kind of a big one, right? So the diet industry loves to trigger this one. They love it. There is a massive, massive amount of marketing on toxic foods you should never eat. They are literally tip tapping into this brain, this part of your survival, right? As if humans won't survive without knowing exactly what's there. So this is important, right? And the fifth one would be pleasure. Do I like it? Does it taste good? So you can kind of see the priority in this. Can you see how that works? You're not gonna care so much about pleasure if you don't have any food, right? You're in that state of angst. You're in a state of panic, which does reduce your need for food in terms of digestion. Leptin levels do go up if you are in stress. Um, pleasure is not the most important. You're probably thinking these three things. Now, I want you to put yourself in that state of mind where food is not available what it would feel like to happen upon some food. How would that feel? Just go there. Oh my God, there's food, right? And then being able to go, I could, this is enough for my, the group of people I have. And then there just so happens to be a fishing rod, right? A rifle. That would be amazing, right? Because you could somehow restock the food you have. It would be super exciting, right? That's the hedonic area of the brain would be like, I'm enlightened in this moment. And the next thing is, is it safe to eat? And then can we make it taste good? It's a big part of our survival. So when you read Satter's hierarchy of me, she really goes into quick access and then getting more and then um, pleasure. Right. Once you get here, once you kind of get into this zone, you can, you are, there is a point at which you can, let's say, uh, I um, had to get, I didn't have to, but I was going to go get a colonoscopy and I couldn't eat for like hours on end. Did that trigger any fight or flight in me? Not at all. Right. Because I had context for why. I know I have access. I know I can always get more. And there was a good reason for it, right? So the, the studies around what really triggers insecurity um, are really kind of cool out there. They've taken groups. Um, here's a study. They, uh, they took three groups of people, had all three groups eat the same exact food restriction. They restricted it, organized it. Each group ate the same exact protocol. Um, and, but they gave them different reasons and different rewards. The first group, the reason was for weight loss. The second group, the reason was for weight loss. The third group was for a spiritual fast. Okay. Go back to the first group. They were given the food and told to isolate, take all food out of their home and to leave just the food that they had in that, that they were allotted in, in, in available to them. They were not to go out. They were not to, you know, they were just to stay focused on the food without any other food around them. The second group, you were to eat this food, but you're also to be okay with other food being around you 
and other people eating around you. We're not going to isolate you from reality, but you need to hold yourself within the restraints of this, this protocol. The third group, same. You can eat what you can, you can be in reality. Here is your food, but we're doing this for a uh, cause, for um, something that's meaningful for you. This is a fast, right? So those were the three groups. They studied cravings, desires, uh, feelings of victimhood, martyrdom. Um, and they also looked at feeding behavior after it was over. So which group, who in here thinks that the group, uh, group one that was isolated from alternative, well, which, who, which group do you guys think over eight the most and felt the most victimized by dieting? Yeah, one and two for weight, three for spirituality. And the second group um, were allowed to be around other people eating. Yes, I think I'm no, you say it. Yeah, number two. How many of you think number two had the most binge eating? How about group one? How about group three? How many of you don't know? <laughs> like only half of you raise your hands all the time. Group two had the highest binge, and they actually use the term binge eating behavior. This looks like uncontrollable binge eating group two, and they believe it's because of the perceptions of being deprived, okay? This does not really talk about what would happen if you are not allowed to eat while others are. So imagine biologically or evolutionary wise, if you're in the group that is being starved, right? And there are people with lots of access to food around you, how that would feel. So what they describe is the defense mechanism. So you're going to defend your access to food as if someone is attacking it. So if you are restricting food, while food is around, there is a very loud defense mechanism that can get triggered that will tell you to eat and eat it all. So there's no preservation involved in that. You're not actually thinking, well, I don't have access to food. I should, I should spread it out. You're thinking, I'm going to see if I can get it and I'm going to eat it as fast as I can because I'm going to try to hide that at access like you've done something wrong, right? So just think about that. Why would that be so triggering, right? Well, because there might be issues connected to belonging in that. You're not allowed to eat. Um, how many of you, yourself, or of you know someone who would hide food in their bedroom, in their closets from their parents, right? Chances are your parents might have dieted, right? Or told you, you can't have that. I, for one, my parents didn't diet, but we were poor, like super poor. And we didn't have fruit. I mean, this was in Alaska. We were living in Alaska. So we were eating vitamin C tablets because that's what we could afford. And we were drinking powdered milk because we couldn't afford real milk. And my mom had the kitchen like turned off. There was no option of eating until our meal. And I was hungry all of the time. And <laughs> I think it's pretty cute now to <laughs> think about it. I would go to the, my friend's house and she would bring me graham crackers, a whole pack, and I would literally oh, eat the whole thing. That wasn't me feeling sorry for myself. That was me literally trying to get as any food I could just because I was chronically hungry, right? And of 10 kids, like I had 10 siblings and I was number nine. I was one of the children. The older siblings would eat and then they would go back. And if it was gone, it was gone. The kitchen was closed. So I oftentimes would go hungry, not knowing that. I mean, you're a child. You don't know. You just adapt. I was happy. 
right? I just thought my friends, I didn't know how to program programmers. Like what? I survived on MREs. You guys know what MREs are? I still think they sound good. I'm like, oh, that cheese you squeeze out of those bags. Mm. Because I think I, they became something that were, was like <laughs> delicious because they were with something you could eat. So I ended up with an eating disorder. Do you think that had anything to do with my eating disorder? Hell no, it didn't. Not at all. That had nothing to do with my eating disorder. The thin supremacy and the idea that my work came from my thinness is where my eating disorder came from. It had nothing to do with having experienced starvation for a long period of time. The illusion that it's, that it's connected to that there's been studies, the Minnesota Starvation Project. Any of you heard of the Minnesota Starvation Project? If you're going to go into dietetics, you're going to hear about it. After World War II, they did studies because at World War II, there were people who were starved. Talk about the concentration camps, right? People were literally starved to death while outside of those gates, everybody was eating fine, right? You can imagine the amount of desire to steal, that they got access to, to binge. Anyways, I'm digressing. So when the war was over, there were a lot of people that came out of those concentration camps that were starved. They had no science. They had no protocols for how to read feed. And so they were getting breads and rice and fruits. And some of them died of heart attacks because their entire system, their thyroid, right? Their whole body was emaciated and it was like toxic to them in that state. If you go get treatment for anorexia, they don't just give you food. They have to slowly give you nutrition to just so they don't kill you, right? Because you're on the verge of a heart attack anyways. So after World War II, there was this need and this desire to understand how what, what happens when someone is starved. What happens psychologically? What happens biologically? What happens, um, how do we refeed? And so the University of Minnesota had the Minnesota Starvation Project. They had groups of men volunteer to be starved and to be watched, monitored, and not only were they starved, but they were also exercised because most of the time when someone is starving, they are not just sedentary. They're probably trying to forage, they're trying to hunt, they're trying to get this. So they were required to walk, I think, three miles a day. Um, and they fed them all the same amount of food for months. And then they, they, they dropped their calories. And it was really only till about to about, I think, 1,600 calories to 1,400 calories for three months. Okay. And they observed patterns, thoughts, behaviors. And for those three months, the men generally became obsessed with food. They became obsessed. Um, some of them fantasized about what they would want to eat. Food became like just basic conversation about with everybody. Some of them were became obsessed about recipes. And then um, they... Um, a couple of them, when they were allowed to leave, let's say, because they could go and hang out with family and they could go to a movie theater, they would go and binge and then come back. And in general, they would go and then um, try to keep it hidden, like they'd done something wrong. Anyways, I'm going to squeeze this into the next minute. What they found after the fact is everybody had compensatory eating everybody over eight for months and they would and they everybody gained a, uh, the weight back that they had lost and then some more but for the most part everybody stopped overeating and life went back to normal over time now i want you to think of this differently now imagine if the same group of people were then asked to do it again two months later and then again and then again for years and then ask them that whoever loses the most weight you win so we're going to start comparing how much weight you lose with each other and you're going to be seen on a hierarchy is more valuable or less valuable depending on how well you control yourself now what do you think would happen in that situation with their feeding behavior 
You think they might start binge eating more, more of them would start binge eating, more of them might start binging between when they have to go back on their starvation protocol. The whiplash between you can have food, you can't have food, you can have food, you cannot have food. And then your value being attached to how well you manage your starvation. You think that might have anything to do with our society's like large amount of people over consuming. That how many people in this country diet at every given point? It's like 30% of the United States is trying to deprive themselves. While food is around, and we all know the science behind that, you're going to end up overeating. And then, you, or you have to hide, so you get to restrict your time with people. You're going to overcompensate when it's over. And if you are anticipating going back on that diet, you're going to even overcompensate more. And then you're going to go back into the diet, right? So when you look at just biological wiring around these basic things, and this doesn't include when food is you're not allowed to eat when others are, because that's the defense mechanism. That makes this like fiery. Okay, I'll see you guys on Monday.